The nervous system is responsible for a wide variety of tasks. So it allows us to sense different things, different smells, produce speech, remember past events, to have feelings and emotions. It also controls body movements and regulates the operation of some of our internal organs. So all of these activities can be grouped into three basic functions of the nervous system. The sensory input, where sensory receptors detect a stimulus. So the stimulus may be something internal, such as an increase in blood pressure, or an external stimulus, such as a bug lands on your arm. The sensory information is then carried to the brain and the spinal cord through cranial and spinal nerves. The integrative function is where the nervous system processes that sensory information by analyzing it, relating it to something that we know, uh, or causing just reflexive actions to happen, so making decisions or causing an appropriate response. This activity is known as integration or processing. And then the motor functions, once that sensory information has been integrated or processed, the nervous system may elicit an appropriate response by activating effectors, muscles, or glands. It does so through those cranial and spinal nerves. So stimulation of the effectors then causes muscles to contract or glands to secrete. So let's look at a, a simple example of how all of these work together. So suppose you are sitting at your desk or on your bed or wherever you study and suddenly you smell mom's apple pie. Now what just happened? You had sensory receptors that detected that smell. So the chemicals that were dissolved in the atmosphere around you were bound to receptors in your olfactory mucosa. So fancy way of saying your nose has receptors that detected that smell. All right, so that was your sensory function of the nervous system. That information was then relayed to your brain where it was associated with something that you know. So that smell was a stimulus that was sent to the brain and the brain thinks, oh, mom's baking apple pie again. And you think about the last time you had apple pie and you think about how good it tastes. And you may have thought, oh, well, Susie was here last time I had apple pie and we put whipped cream on the top of it. So all of that was integration. You were processing that stimulus. And then your motor function or motor division of the nervous system came into play when you jumped up, threw that book down, and ran to the kitchen, and all those muscles were contracting to carry you in there. Now, all this can continue when you take a bite of that pie, and sensory receptors again are being stimulated, this time your taste buds, right? So uh, just sort of a, a, a brief example to show you how all of these parts of the nervous system work together. So this requires a lot of tissues and a lot of cells that have to take on all of these roles, whether it's receptors that are detecting a stimulus, it's uh, nervous cells that are integrating and processing this information, or it's nerve cells that are causing muscles to contract. So when we're looking at the tissues that make up the nervous system, we divide them into two big categories, neurons or nerves, and neuroglial cells. So these cells combine in a number of ways in different regions of the nervous system, and they form these very complex processing networks within the brain and the spinal cord. Neurons are also going to connect all regions of the body to the brain and the spinal cord. Neurons are responsible for functions such as sensing and thinking and remembering, controlling muscle activity, regulating glandular secretion. And as a result of all this specialization, most neurons have lost their ability to divide or undergo mitosis. So these are excitable cells that transmit electrical signals. Now we're going to look more at each of these in a little bit more detail. Your neuroglial cells are much smaller cells and they support and nourish and protect neurons. They also help to maintain the interstitial fluid that surrounds the neuroglial cells and the neurons. 
Unlike the neurons, though, n the neuroglial cells continue to be able to divide throughout your lifetime. So neurons and neuroglial cells differ structurally depending on where they're located, whether it's in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system, and of course their function can be different based on where they're located as well. Of the six types of neuroglial cells, four of those, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglial, and epidemal cells are present only in the central nervous system. However, in the peripheral nervous system, we have satellite cells and swan cells. So we'll look at each of these just a little bit. So let's start with the neuroglial cells. So neuroglial cells make up about half the volume of the central nervous system. Their name is derived from the idea that it was once thought that they were the glue. Glia means glue. So glue that holds all the nervous tissue together. Well, we've learned a little bit more about them since then. So we know now that neuroglial cells are smaller than neurons, but they're about 5 to 25 times more numerous. They don't generate action potentials, but they can multiply and divide in mature nervous tissue. In cases of injury or disease, it's the neuroglial cells that multiply and fill up the spaces that was formerly occupied by those neurons that were damaged in the disease or the injury. Interesting thing about these, uh, when you have a tumor that's derived from glial cells, it's called a glioma, and it tends to be very, very highly malignant and it grows rapidly. So neuroglial cells, as we mentioned, uh, can be divided by their types. So we'll look at the different types of these with a brief description of them. Uh, I guess first let's look at a cool picture. So here you can see a neuroglial cell. Here you've got, this looks like it may be an astrocyte, uh, not quite sure, uh, but the astrocytes are very star-shaped in that they had a lot, have a lot of extensions coming off their cell body, and then you have smaller little cells uh, all around this. So this is a photohistograph, and here you can see a drawing where you have several of the types of neuroglial cells all together. So you have oligodendrocytes that are going to wrap around some of the axons and the teeny tiny little microglial cells and the two types of astrocytes. Uh, and then what else do we have? Oh yes, the ependymal cells that we'll talk about that are going to create sort of a barrier. So let's begin by looking first at the astrocytes. So astrocytes, as I mentioned, are somewhat star-shaped cells that have many processes. So these are the largest and the most numerous of all the neuroglial cells. The processes of the astrocytes make contact with blood capillaries and neurons and also the pia mater, which is a, a membrane that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. So these cells help to anchor the neurons to the blood supply and basically sort of regulate the chemical environment for neurons so that the appropriate ions are available for the generation of nerve impulses. So they support, maintain the chemical environment and also wrap around those blood capillaries. Um, and by doing so, they help to keep things from moving in and out of the blood and into the brain. Uh, astrocytes are also thought to play a role in memory and learning, which we'll talk more about when we look at brain function. The microglial cells are very small little cells, uh, so they have very slender little processes that give off a whole lot of spine-like little projections. They function sort of like phagocytes, so you can think of them as the immune systems of the cells. So like macrophages, they remove cellular debris that's formed during the normal development of the nervous system. They also phagocytize microbes and damaged nerve tissue. Next we'll look at the ependymal cells. So these are somewhat cuboidal to columnar shaped in their arrangement. They form a single layer and they possess microvilli and cilia. So these cells line the ventricles of the brain and the central canal of the spinal cord. So ventricles are fluid-filled spaces that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And that fluid, of course, is going to protect and nourish the brain and the spinal cord. 
functionally the ependymal cells produce and probably from what's known monitor uh, and assist in the circulation of that cerebrospinal fluid. They also help to form the uh, blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier which we'll talk about more later but it also helps to prevent uh, things from moving from the blood into the central nervous system. And next we'll look briefly at the oligodendrocytes. So these sort of also resemble the astrocytes in that they have a lot of processes, but they're smaller and they have fewer processes. The processes of the oligodendrocytes are responsible for forming and maintaining, maintaining a myelin sheath around central nervous system axons. So as you'll see shortly, the myelin sheath is a multi-layered covering around some axons that insulates them, insulates the axons and helps to increase the rate of transmission of the nerve impulses. So the uh, axons that have this myelin sheath around them are said to be myelinated axons. Neuroglial cells of the peripheral nervous system completely surround axons and cell bodies. So the two types of glial cells in the PNS or peripheral nervous system are Schwann cells and satellite cells. The satellite cells are flat cells that surround the cell bodies of neurons. They provide structural support and help to regulate the exchange of materials between neuronal cell bodies and the interstitial fluid. The Schwann cells, on the other hand, uh, are going to encircle peripheral nervous system axons. Like the oligodendrocytes that we saw in the central nervous system, they're going to form the myelin sheath around those axons. However, in the central nervous system, a single oligodendrocyte myelinated several axons, but each Schwann cell myelinates a single axon. So here you can see each one of these is a Schwann cell wrapped around this yellow structure, which is the axon. So this is a Schwann cell wrapped around the axon. This is a Schwann cell wrapped around the axon. And here is a third. So the covering is called a myelin sheath. It's the cells that wrap around the axon and create the covering. Okay, so... The Schwann cells create a myelin sheath, but a single Schwann cell can also uh, enclose as many as 20 or more unmyelinated axons, or axons that don't have a myelin sheath. So here you can see the Schwann cell, which is this sort of pink color here. There's the, the nucleus of the Schwann cell, and it's not wrapping around these axons, so they're not myelinated. They're just sort of surrounded by the Schwann cell. So remember, a myelin sheath is a covering where the cell wraps around and around and around that axon. So your myelinated axons are going to transmit action potentials or nerve impulses much, much more quickly than those axons of unmyelinated cells. The Schwann cells are also going to participate in axon regeneration or recreation, which we'll see uh, near the end of this chapter is more easily accomplished in the peripheral nervous system than the central nervous system because of some of the characteristics of these Schwann cells. Next we're going to look at neurons. Like muscle cells, neurons are electrically excitable, so that means they have the ability to respond to a stimulus and convert it into an action potential. So what is a stimulus? A stimulus is a change in the environment that's strong enough to initiate an action potential. Well, that leads us to the next question. What is an action potential? An action potential is a nerve impulse. So it's an electrical signal that propagates or travels along the surface of the membrane of a neuron. It begins and travels due to the movement of ions Remember sodium and potassium and their role, their role in muscle contraction? Well, we're going to be looking at the same thing with action potentials. So these ions are moving between the interstitial fluid and the inside of a neuron through ion channels that are in the membrane of the cell. Once it's begun, a nerve impulse travels rapidly and at a constant strength. So neurons conduct nerve impulses. They are said to have longevity, 
in that once they are created, they have a very long lifespan that may last throughout your lifespan if they are not destroyed by disease or injury. Uh, so these cells are amitotic, as we mentioned at the beginning. But that simply means that they're unable to undergo mitosis or unable to divide and create new cells. However, that is a pretty hot topic in research right now. And there is some work being done that shows that there are some neurons that have a limited available or a limited ability to undergo mitosis and create new cells. So neuroplasticity is the ability of these neurons to sprout new processes and make new connections. So when they do so, they also have to disconnect from old pathways. So the way that the neurons are communicating with other cells is always changing. These cells also, because they are constantly undergoing um, metabolic processes and sending action potentials and receiving stimuli, they are very, very highly metabolic. So if they are constantly doing their job, which is to conduct nerve impulses, then they are using a lot of ATP. So they need to have a very, uh, very vast blood supply bringing in that oxygen rich blood so we can create ATP for that high metabolic rate. We're going to now look at the structures of the neurons. So neurons have cell bodies and processes and we classify those processes as axons or dendrites. So when we're talking about the structure and terminology in neurons, if we're talking about the central nervous system versus the peripheral nervous system, you may see the terminology differs a little bit. So the cell body of a neuron in the central nervous system uh, can be called nuclei or you have a group of cell bodies that can be called nuclei. Now this is different from the nucleus of the cell. In the peripheral nervous system when we have a group of cell bodies we call it ganglia. So you'll see these when we look at spinal cord anatomy. The processes also so can be called something different in the peripheral versus the central nervous system. So the processes usually are going to consist of the axons and the dendrites and sometimes you'll have groups of these together. So in the central nervous systems, these can be called tracts. In the peripheral nervous system, nerves. All right, confused enough? I know. Sort of like when we were doing um, nerve or when we were doing muscle tissue and there were so many things that were known by very similar names. So don't get bogged down in the terminology. Let's understand what's going on with these. So a brief overview here before we look at some of these in more detail while we've got the entire picture here. This is the cell body or the soma and of course within the soma you have the nucleus and you have the uh, mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi and all the things that you normally find within a cell body. Sticking off the cell body, you have these processes or extensions of the cytoplasm. These are known as dendrites. So dendrites are going to be your receivers. And then you have a long axon that is your transmitter. So a stimulus is brought into the cell through the dendrites processed in the cell body as depolarization occurs. And then that action impulse or nerve impulse travels along the axon down to the end of the axon where it branches into these small little structures called axon terminals that end with these little bulb-like structures. Now I know I used a lot of terminology there that was sort of vague. The reason for that is we're going to talk about each one of these in more detail. Something else I want to point out while we're looking here at this axon, this is a myelinated axon. Okay, so you have Schwann cells that have wrapped around this axon creating a myelin sheath. Okay, so let's look first at the dendrites. So dendrites are the receiving or input portions of the neuron. So the plasma membranes of the dendrites and the cell bodies contain numer numerous receptor sites for binding chemical messengers from other cells. Dendrites are typically short, tapering, and highly branched. 
So think of the dendrites as the receivers. Here's the cell body or the soma, and here's the axon. Here we've got axon terminals and little synaptic knobs. So just a normal structure of a neuron. So remember, dendrites are your receivers. And then we move into the axons. So the axon, we typically only have one per neuron. So here we've got an image with two neurons. So here's the cell body. Here are your dendrites. Here's the axon of uh, neuron number one. Here's the cell body and the dendrites and the axon of neuron number two. Okay, so the axons of the neuron are going to propagate the nerve impulses toward another neuron as you see in this picture, or a muscle fiber, or perhaps a gland. So the axon is a long, thin, cylindrical projection that sometimes joins to the cell body at sort of a cone-shaped structure known as the axon hillock. So here you can see the body of the neuron. This enlarged area is the axon hillock. Okay, so the axon hillock is where the cell is basically going to determine whether or not to fire a nerve impulse. So when we start talking about the propagation of the axon, or propagation of the ax action potential, we'll look more at that axon hillock. Okay, so if we follow that axon, uh, we can see that down toward the end of that, we have the axon terminals, the little terminal branches, and then the little bulbs at the end. So the axon terminals have those little knob-like ends where a lot of neurotransmitters and other chemicals are going to be stored that can then be released and cause something to happen in the next cell, right? So if we look at this little image here, you've got the axon terminal of neuron number one. Let's move it out here where we can see it a little better. So here's the axon terminal and chemicals known as neurotransmitters are being released and that's going to cause an action to happen in this part of the image, which is the second neuron. Okay, so that first neuron is going to release neurotransmitters that will stimulate the second neuron. Uh, another term that you may see mentioned is the axolemma. That's simply the membrane of the axon. Okay, uh, all right, so axons are going to generate those nerve impulses and transmit that away from the cell body. So an electrical impulse is, is generated there at the axon hillock, then the action potential or depolarization, as you'll see when we continue to talk about this, is going to travel along that axon where it causes the release of neurotransmitters from the axon terminals. That will then stimulate the next cell.